Reichstag, the German government died. And here, in the wreckage of his own chancellery, died Hitler, the architect of ruin. And amid the rubble of her war museums and the rusting trophies of criminal conquest, died the homicidal arrogance of the Third Reich. From the historic pulpit where the Nazi doctrine of destruction was preached, Hitler's balcony, a sightseeing Russian soldier looks out on what is left of Germany today. Today, German women grub for extra rations in the desolation that was the Tiergarten, the once fashionable central park of Berlin. Its statuary of Germany's historic heroes disfigured and forgotten. The Tiergarten today is nothing but a vast potato patch, a defeat garden. Long months after the war's end, streets that once teemed with life and traffic lie stricken and dead in the heart of once great cities. A few miles distant, the countryside has been left unmarred by battle and slumbers in a peace that was never really broken. Bombs have long ceased falling, but in the gigantic cleanup program with which Germany is saddled, buildings must still be blasted. Germans are liable to the labor draft. But brick by brick, the Trümmerfrauen, the wreckage women, do much of the back and heartbreaking work of cleaning up the enormous mess left behind by history's most destructive war. But even amid the appalling devastation, some Germans, those who prospered while their country suffered, managed to enjoy themselves. They dance and drink to once outlawed American jazz. people find simpler pleasures. Even in Frankfurt, a city where 80% of their homes have been damaged or destroyed from the air. Today, children who have never known anything but war can look up again without fear. Once a banking and chemical center, Frankfurt's commercial life is at a standstill. These people, whose mass dementia launched five wars in the past 80 years, are tasting today the defeat and humiliation they inflicted on their neighbors. 17 million of them are living under rules and conditions imposed by the people of the United States. The one thing that is noticeable everywhere is that the war has wounded everyone, mentally, spiritually, or physically. The ruins in us, they say, are worse than the ruins around us. Germany, a nation of banner worshippers, has forfeited the right to a flag of her own. Today, the only flags that fly in Germany are those of her conquerors. The Allied Control Council, composed of representatives of the Big Four, governs Germany today. General Pierre Koenig is French commander for Germany. Marshal of the Soviet Union, Sokolovsky, commands the Russian occupation forces. Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Sir Sholto Douglas of Great Britain. And America's supreme commander in Germany is General Joseph McNani. Each power puts its own national stamp on Germany. The biggest victory monument in Berlin today was erected by the Russians, who occupy the largest zone, rich in agriculture and industry. Germany today has become a testing ground as to whether the Western powers can get along successfully with the Russians. This was Germany's proudest monument, the Victory Pillar, glorifying the conquest of France in 1871. Today, the French tricolor is kept flying from its top in proud retaliation for the swastika Hitler hoisted on the Eiffel Tower. 
France governs her zone on the theory that it shall never again be part of a unified nation. A permanently divided Germany, she feels, is the only guarantee of peace in Europe. Britain, which controls the industrial Ruhr, was the first power to accept America's proposal for a merging of zones, which we regard as an essential step if Germany is not to remain a poorhouse in the heart of Europe. The Americans erected no victory monuments, but typical of our occupation is Truman Hall, which we built in Berlin. From the United States Office of Military Government, headquartered in buildings once occupied by Goering's Air Force, we administer our German zone. Specially uniformed Germans, those few who can be trusted with guns, help us guard our installations. Carrying out our policies in Germany is Lieutenant General Clay, Deputy Military Governor. It is a vast administration he heads, embracing hundreds of departments and units, costing $200 million a year, extending over an area as large as the state of Michigan, and including thousands of qualified personnel, economics and political experts, educators, agriculturists, specialists in everything from fertilizer to culture. Without imports from America, Germans under our military government would starve. Every problem in Germany, housing, clothing, health, industry, is desperate, but the most acute is food. We are literally keeping our former enemies alive. Even with our help, the average German ration is 35% below minimum health needs, and the average German is 30 pounds underweight. General McNaughty has said, you can't teach democracy to hungry men. And we are trying to teach Germans democracy. In this former Nazi publishing plant, our army issues a newspaper for the Germans. As editor-in-chief, an American major sets the pattern for honest journalism in our zone. After 13 years of lies and distortions, Germans can now read the truth, and many of them are responding. This editor gives English lessons through the columns of the newspaper. Thousands of Germans faithfully do their lessons at home and write in for help in learning our language. The Germans also publish papers of their own, licensed by the various occupying authorities. They are free to buy whatever paper they wish. But in our zone, the American army paper has by far the largest circulation. Radio, the Nazis' greatest propaganda weapon, now serves democratic ends. Carefully chosen German announcers, script writers, and technicians do their jobs under American supervision. American movies, long banned in Germany, provide a few precious hours of escape from dismal reality. vital responsibility in Germany is for the youth. After years of Nazi poison in the schoolrooms, the children now get revised textbooks and are taught by anti-Nazi teachers. The future of the world may well depend on how these children grow up. Their minds are open and eager, ready to take on the stamp we give them. But democracy must be taught in the schoolyard as well as the schoolroom. Our GIs teach German boys American sports and sportsmanship. Baseball is a new game for German kids, but they quickly get into the old sandlot spirit. Our occupation has revived political life in Germany. Posters of rival parties are pasted on the ruins caused by a one-party government. Elections in the American zone bring out from 70 to 80 percent of eligible voters, a much higher proportion than in the United States. A concentration camp victim is carried to the polls as Germans conduct their own elections, choose their own officials. Of four major parties in our zone, the Christian Democrats are strongest, the Communists a weak third. 
Germans can again express their will in public demonstrations. Under the Nazis, a protest meeting like this would have meant broken heads and corpses in the street. These Germans are demanding that three top-ranking Nazis acquitted at Nuremberg be tried before a German court of justice. A disarmed Germany with no more need for army helmets makes them into pots and pans. But revival of normal German production has been painfully slow. Zonal barriers paralyze trade, choking off the flow of basic materials. War industry has ceased. Peace industry is crippled. As occupation goes on, more and more American families arrive to settle down in Germany. Wives and children of military government personnel. By the end of 1947, an estimated 16,000 of these American families will be living in Germany and Austria. For them, the American standard of living and the American way of life has been transported overseas and installed amid the ruins of defeated Germany. Occupation girls, American secretaries, stenographers, specialists, live in Germany by the hundreds. These girls are cozily installed in the mansion of Grand Admiral Dönitz, a Nazi war criminal now in jail. There is no servant problem for the American housewife in Germany. A typical housewife may have a housemaid, a nursemaid for the children, and a gardener, all German. Ordinary GI also finds agreeable features in occupation life. At Von Zee, complete sailing facilities are put at the disposal of our troops, who have their choice of all manner of excellent craft in which well-to-do Nazis once disported themselves. All GI Joe and Jane have to do is sign up, and a yacht is theirs for the afternoon. In the famous Olympic Stadium in Berlin, GI football teams representing units in Germany and Austria give it the old college try. The setting is Berlin, but the spirit is strictly Bula Bula. Life for our 300,000 occupation troops, mostly young draftees without combat experience, has many attractions in Germany. But peacetime service overseas can often be dull and monotonous. And Germany is a long, long way from home and family. So everything within reason is done to make things agreeable for occupation personnel. Caddies get paid off in American cigarettes, which are virtually legal tender in Germany today. A whole pack being roughly equivalent to a month's pay. But there is still danger in Germany. This is the notorious Dachau concentration camp, as it looks today. 300,000 victims of Nazi brutality were murdered here. It is still a prison, but now Nazis themselves are the prisoners. These are SS troops, once the dread and terror of Europe. Many of their comrades are still at large, plotting against the occupation, waiting for a chance to strike. These are not ordinary German soldiers for well, their membership in the SS automatically makes them suspect as war criminals. They will be kept under guard until they can be tried by allied courts. In Germany today, the black market operates openly, draining the life blood from legitimate trade, exploiting the needy and fattening racketeers. Photographed secretly, this is a Munich black market doing business as usual. It poses another occupation problem. Our MPs must do a policing job, not only against black markets, but against subversive elements of all kinds. In this raid, evidence, knives, cigarettes, bicycles, is thrown away and scattered at the approach of the police. The black marketeers are rounded up and hauled off to face charges in court. Another way of fighting the black market is through legitimate barter marts. Here, Germans can bring goods they want to trade, get an expert appraisal, and swap them for other goods of the same value. A major problem is still denazification. The Germans themselves now put Nazis on trial. 
In our zone, denazification has progressed further than in any other. Nevertheless, many Nazis go free, and only a small percentage are made to pay the full penalty for their crimes. Many Germans, like this Jeep driver, are still doing Goebbels' propaganda work. They do all they can to spread pro-German views among our troops and justify Germany's record. German girls sing the same song to fraternizing GIs. Poor Germany, the Fräulein say. It wasn't our fault. The same sad story is peddled to American housewives by their servants. Wherever Germans and Americans come together, the propaganda goes on. Germany today, festering in the ruins she brought on herself, is not a penitent, regenerate nation. The Germans, nursing old and new hatreds, are listening hourly for the voice of any leader that desperation may produce. Tough, uprooted Hitler youth hold the seeds of tomorrow's danger. Potential storm troops of 1960 are still there, breeding and brooding in the devastation of defeat. So America must remain on guard until these people have forgotten how to hate.